church, why don't you go ahead and stand. Happy Palm Sunday. We're going to just worship the Lord with all our hearts. He deserves the praise. Amen. He's worthy this morning. All right. Oh, I saw Satan fall like lightning. I saw darkness run full cover.
we praise our God this morning. Thank you, Lord. God, we thank you that you are our firm foundation. God, on you, our solid rock we stand. All other ground is sinking sand, Lord. Thank you for this truth we can declare this morning as we enter Holy Week today, Lord, and we remember Palm Sunday. Lord, we remember as you entered the city of Jerusalem on a donkey, Lord, we remember that there were cloaks laid out before your path, Lord. There were palm branches waved in your presence and there were voices shouting and singing, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And Lord, today as we worship you, as we're gathered here today, we just wanna join in that same spirit of belief. God, back then there were people that were waving those branches and saying, saying that phrase with deep faith and belief that you were the Messiah, that you were the Savior come to save the world from sin and death. And so Lord, we bring that same conviction, that same belief today with us this morning as we worship you, Lord. Because God, if we believe that you truly are a firm foundation, if we believe that you truly are more than able to do immeasurably more than we could ever ask or imagine, Lord, we can come to you with that confidence right now, God. We can come to you with that belief in our hearts. And God, if we truly believe that there is no prayer that's too small for you to hold, if we believe that there's no dream in our hearts or care or concern that we have, that we, we can bring those before you, God, knowing that you are capable of holding those things for us right now. And that can be an act of our worship towards you, God, our trust and our hope for you to hold those prayers and to hold those thoughts for us, God. And Lord, I also pray that if we truly believe that you can perform miracles, Lord, with the faith of a tiny seed. Can you imagine what the Lord can do with the faith in this room this morning? Can you just imagine that today? So Lord, we worship you, God, and we declare you are more than able. We bring all of this before you as we continue to worship you and sing to you, Jesus. Hallelujah. When did I start to forget All of the great things you did When did I throw away faith For the impossible And how did I start to believe That you weren't sufficient for me why do I talk myself out of seeing your miracles? Because you are more than able. Can we sing that with truth this morning? He is more than able. Come on, lift your voice. You are more. faith rise in this room this morning we sing to you Jesus you are more than able who am I to deny what the Lord can do we worship you Lord Hosanna Hosanna in the highest oh yes now
that you can carry our burdens and concerns, that you can bring healing in our lives, Jesus. So we worship you. Can you imagine what the Lord can do with all the faith in the room? Let's sing that here this morning. Can you imagine? Come on, let's sing. happen just let the way make it through Jesus on this Palm Sunday we invite the way maker to come through God we lay down the things that we've been holding on to and we invite the king of kings the one who came to make a way Jesus we invite for you to come through God, we invite for you to enter in to our situations and to our broken places. God, we trust you because we believe that you are more than able. Come on, church, do we believe that he is more than able? Jesus, it's easy to look at our circumstances and be intimidated by anxiety we can't get over, by depression we can't walk through, or to look at broken relationships that we don't know how to repair on our own. 
But God, you promise us that you are the one who brings dead things back to life, that you are the one that sees solutions we can't even know how to pray for. God, you are more than able to make a way. Jesus. So who am I to deny what the Lord can do? Jesus, we thank you. God, we invite you in today. Lord, do the work in us that we can't do in ourselves. Lord, we trust you, we love you, and we thank you for who you are. It's in the matchless name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. 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 Church, would you put your hands together in gratitude for what the Lord can do today. Friends, go ahead and take a seat. Thank you all so much for joining us here at the Bay Church Concord. My name is Nathan. I'm one of the youth pastors here. For all of our middle schoolers and high schoolers, I'm going to see y'all right here on Tuesday night at 630 for an amazing youth service. It's going to be great. Uh, hey, we have so many incredible things that happen here at the Bay Church. And if you're new with us, we would love to stay connected with you. Uh, if you are new, would you do me a favor and scan the QR code right here on the side? Yes, go ahead and pull out your phones in church. It's okay. Uh, scan this code. We would love to be able to connect with you and learn more about how we can serve you and partner with you in the amazing life journey ahead. Uh, this week, we have some amazing things happening. We have a couple of Good Friday services. So on Friday, bring some friends, bring some family. At 5.30, we have more of a family-style service. So no child care. Bring your kids in with you to worship alongside of you to celebrate Good Friday. And then at 7 p.m., we have a full service with child care provided as well. Then on Easter, somebody say Easter. Let's go. On Easter, we have five Easter services, all right? So grab one of these Easter cards. You got one on the way in the door. Do not leave empty-handed. Bring one or five or 12 of these with you when you leave because they're not really of any use to us after today, all right? Uh, so please, bring them home. Hand them out to your neighbors. Shove them in some mailboxes and in the little crack between the door. Uh, bring some friends with you when you come to Easter, all right? Carpooling doesn't just save gas, it saves souls. So bring some people with you. We'd love to have you come. I'm going to read the times out, all right? This is important because they're different from our normal times. We have 8 a.m., 9.30, 11, 12.30, and 2 p.m., all right? So come, bring some friends. And then at the 12.30 and the 2 p.m. service, we need some more folks who would be willing to serve during those services, uh, to maybe hand out some food, uh, help run some of the incredible stuff that's going to be happening out on the patio. If you're available to do either of those, there's going to be a QR code up here on the screen that you can scan to fill out to serve. So please go ahead and scan that. We need as many people as possible during the 12.30 and 2 p.m. service. Uh, you can even sneak an extra churro. I won't tell anybody. We would love to have you guys' help with that. Uh, one of the amazing things we also get to celebrate is seeing what God does through the Bay Church in our community and around the world. And we do that by having once a month a day uh, specially dedicated to hearing from one of our hundred or so missionaries that we support. And so I'd like to invite out our missionary guest for today. Would you all welcome Bram as he comes out here to share with us? Awesome. Would you just go ahead and introduce yourself and the ministry that you serve with? Yeah, my name is Bram Begonia, and I'm the president and CEO of the Bay Area Rescue Mission. I might be a new face to some of you, but this church uh, has been partnering with the Bay Area Rescue Mission for over 30 years, and we're very thankful for your support. So thank you on behalf of the Bay Area Mission staff and our volunteers. God bless you. Come on. I can say uh, without hesitation, you have, I think, the coolest name of any of the missionaries I've ever had the pleasure of hosting. Uh, so would you just tell us uh, maybe, maybe some highlight stories or impact stories from the work that you guys do? Yeah, for some of you that don't know, the Bay Area Rescue Mission opened in 1965. We're in a place called the Iron Triangle in Richmond, right, where all the gangs are. We're still top 10 in violence and crime in California. And so that's where the real ministry is taking place. And in 1965, this man opened up this little shelter to 12 hots, uh, we call it 12 cots and a hot, 12 cots and a hot, right? 12 cots were put out to take care of 12 men and 36 meals. Today, we are the largest provider of homeless services in Contra Costa County. So, and thank you. And so we continue to serve men. We now have a shelter for men. Uh, 
women and women with children. We have a year-long life transformation program. We try to get them out of the shelter. We don't get ever, any government funding, so we're fully supported by churches and, and uh, donors who support the work that we do. And we believe in a holistic mi- uh, ministry that is mind, body, and spirit. You can over- overcome all that trauma, but if you don't have Jesus in your life, nothing will change. So that's what's taking place at the Bay Area Rescue Mission. Come on. That's amazing. That's amazing. Um, you mentioned during our 9 o'clock service a really impactful testimony of a young man that you guys have had the pleasure of serving. Would you share that yeah. with us? Yeah. Some people just don't know kind of the level of homelessness that's taking place. And we really take it out of Matthew 25, 35 through 40, that if you do it uh, unto the least of these, you're doing it to Jesus. And there are 40,000 homeless people in the Bay Area. There's an actual point in time count in February that takes place where we count everyone in an underpass, everyone in a tent, and nobody wakes up and says, today I want to be at the Bay Area Rescue Mission, right? Nobody aspires to come to a homeless shelter to get their life together, to get off of drugs and alcohol. This young man last year, the week before July 4th, was standing on the Golden Gate Bridge. He had forgotten that he was made by a creator that loves him, and he forgot that he was of value and of worth, and he jumped off the bridge because he had nothing to live for. And the net caught him. There's a net. <laughs> Don't try it. <laughs> Just, there's a net, right? The net caught him. He spent the night on the net. Uh, the police uh, picked him up in the morning, and they brought him to the Bay Area Rescue Mission. We are the safety net for our community. There's no other place to go, right? We share the love of Jesus with him. He's thriving in our program. If you haven't seen a miracle since the birth of your children or your grandchildren, Come to the Bay Area Rescue Mission. You're going to see uh, miracles every single day. We just had our graduation on March 9th, and these lives have been totally transformed. Man, that is incredible. That is incredible. I know for for many of us at the Bay Church, we really highly value this kind of community-oriented service. Uh, We want to be part of what you're doing, but how can we also be serving alongside of you guys in prayer? Uh, You can pray for the Lord to continue to bless us through time, talent, and resources, uh, time, talent, and treasure. Uh, Pre-COVID, we were serving 55,000 meals per month. It's a crazy number. We're one of the largest partners of Food Bank. We actually were an agency that presented right here in your church a few months ago with the uh, Food Bank Agency Summit. And so right now, last year, we provided 1.8 million meals to our community. Wow. And so God has to send that stuff to us. We're just a conduit, yeah. right, from all of our church partners and everything that's taking place uh, for us to serve our community. The needs continue to grow, but we're confident that with, through prayer and with Christ, and everything is possible. Come on. That's amazing. Would you all give it up for Bram? Let's go. Bay Area Thank Rescue you so Mission. Much. Thank you so much for being Thank with you. us God today. Bless. Thank you. Uh, right after service, y'all want to connect with him. He's going to have a table set up right through the doors out here in the back of our auditorium. And so we'd love to just have y'all step in and connect with him. Uh, as we have the opportunity to give, we make an impact in our community and around the world through our missionaries, but also through the work that we do right here on this campus, our Brentwood campus, our Pleasanton campus. Uh, and so if you call the Bay Church home, uh, this is an opportunity where we have the opportunity to, uh, to worship God through our giving, through our generosity. And so as our buckets come forward and our ushers come forward to prepare, we have three ways that you can give. You can give by texting, you can give online, and you can put something old-fashioned way into this bucket. Uh, if you're new here, don't feel any compulsion. This is something that we do when we uh, receive from God. We want to have the opportunity to give back to him. So uh, we always say our, our rule is you don't have to put anything in the bucket. Just please don't take anything out. Uh, if you'd like to specifically designate your gift today for missions, you can also do that. Just write missions on the envelope. Or if you text to give, text the word missions to the number that's on the screen. Uh, I'm going to say a word of prayer. We'll pass those buckets. Father God, thank you so much for who you are, for your generosity to us, and your provision for us. Lord, we love you. We thank you for who you are. God, we give back to you with open hands and a trusting heart. Lord, we love you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. All right, as those buckets pass, friends, go ahead and feel free to say hello to somebody next to you, and we'll continue with the rest of our service. Have a great day.
All right. Good morning, everybody. Nice to see you. Uh, my name is Ryan, one of the pastors, and I've got some good news for you. Um, next Sunday on Easter, our lead pastor is going to be back in the pulpit for all the services after his break. Uh, we're really excited. Pastor John has been uh, on a sabbatical the last few months, just replenishing deep places of energy and vision, and uh, we're pumped to have him back full-time starting next week. So something to look forward to. Um, today is Palm Sunday, the time every year when Christians remember Jesus making his triumphal entry into Jerusalem a week before being killed at Passover time. He's breathing his last on a cross right at the time, just hundreds of yards away, all the Passover lambs are being slaughtered in the temple. Not coincidental. Uh, Jesus rode into Jerusalem, though, a week prior on Palm Sunday. He rode down the slopes of the Mount of Olives. Have a look at what the Mount of Olives looked like today. Okay, I'll point out a couple things. Here on the right, this is the Palestinian village of Silwan, just south of Jerusalem. In the center, all the white area that we're seeing are actually tombstones. That's a huge Jewish cemetery all down the hill. And then there on the left is the Garden of Gethsemane area where Jesus prayed right before he was arrested. And on top, that tower is called the Church of the Ascension. It remembers the place where Jesus ascended to the right hand of God after Easter. So we're going to be looking at a, the story of Palm Sunday today, Jesus coming down this hill. So just to set the scene, we'll keep that up there. Now, if you're standing on top of that hill and you're looking this way towards Jerusalem, what you see today is something like this. That's the Dome of the Rock there in the center, and on the left, the Great Dome is Al-Aqsa Mosque, and it's a huge platform area. It's called the Temple Mount, and then beyond it is the old city of Jerusalem, and then the Jewish modern city is there in the distance. But Jesus, when he crested the Mount of Olives 2,000 years ago, he would have seen something a little different. The Temple Mount was already there, a 37-acre platform built by Herod the Great. That was there. But what Jesus would have seen from the Mount of Olives is actually this. That's the Jewish temple. It's surrounded by massive courtyard areas where merchants and pilgrims mingled together with Jewish officials, priests, and Roman soldiers. This was the epicenter of Jewish life, the privileged meeting point between heaven and earth. Everything that Israel believed about their covenant with God went through this place, the Torah, the priesthood, the Davidic kings, animal sacrifices, the very presence of God. Like anyone who wanted to make their mark in the Jewish world 2,000 years ago had to do it through the temple. So here comes Jesus. And here's the route he took, just so we've got an idea. He starts there in Bethany on the right. In Hebrew, it's Beit Oni, which means house of the poor. That's where Jesus preferred to stay when he was in town in Jerusalem. He would go lodge out with the poor people in Bethany. From there, he goes to Bethphage. And do you know what that means in Hebrew? I don't either. Just let me know if you know. <laughs> then he goes down the slopes of the Mount of Olives, this, to the Garden of Gethsemane. And then he's in the low point in the Kidron Valley there. So it's water and then up the slope into the temple. Make sense? Now, usually we call this day in Jesus' life Palm Sunday. You knew that. And it's not palms like this in the palm of our hand. It's palms out in nature, palm trees. Why is that? Because, I mean, in our culture, a, a palm tree is often a symbol of sort of a tropical paradise. You know, like, I want to go there. I want to go sit under that palm tree on the beach and just live it up, you know, enjoy the good life. Anybody want to go there with me? So if you think of Jesus making his triumphal entry on Palm Sunday, it, you could be forgiven if you think it looks something like this. Have a look at this guy. You know, dude on a skateboard with his denim and his glasses pointing at the paparazzi. He's got the palm tree. It's a triumphal entry. He's an influencer, you know what I mean? No, um, maybe for others of you here in California, when you think of palms, you think of the, the crest, the symbol of the University of Southern California, USC, because a lot of colleges have like a Latin slogan, and the slogan for USC, by the way, any Trojans in the house? I know there's some Trojans who go to the, the Bay Church. The Latin slogan is palmum qui meruit ferat, which means let whoever earns the palm bear it. Now, what does that mean? Well, actually, that little phrase right there is an important clue for us. It's the beginning of a thread that we can follow from the shores of California 2,000 years into the past to the Mediterranean world where Jesus lived. Because throughout much of that Greco-Roman world with also some Jewish elements, the palm tree was seen as a symbol of victory. 
Uh, for example, H Asian athletes in peak condition, when they won their race, their event, they would be given a palm branch. Lawyers, too, when they won their case, they would decorate the gate to their house with palm branches. The goddess of victory, Nike, also known as Nike, was also affiliated with the palm. Before there was the Nike swoosh, there was the Nike branch, the Nike palm. You know, for example, when Julius Caesar won the Battle of Pharsalus, which paved the way for him to become the first emperor of Rome, legend has it that a palm tree sprung up for him miraculously in the temple of Nike. So in the wider Greco-Roman world, the palm of Palm Sunday, it wasn't about what it would be for us, retreating to the, the relaxing periphery of the world for some soaking up some sunshine. No, it was about charging at the center of things and winning. It was a status symbol of prestige, of power. Everyone knew this. The Jewish world, too, which was the home base of Jesus, shared some of this meaning. So about 100 years after Jesus, in the 130s, there was a major Jewish revolt against Rome led by a man who claimed to be the Messiah. His name was Simon Bar Kochba, means Simon, son of the star. And archaeologists have uncovered coins from that revolutionary era and do you know what they have stamped on them as the symbol of Jewish freedom? They have a palm tree. Check out what this coin looks like, and there's others like it. You see the palm tree? So think about this. Here's this Messiah figure whose logo for his movement is a palm branch. Does that combination sound familiar? It should, because the reason the real Messiah, Jesus, was greeted with palm branches in Jerusalem, and we're going to see that in just a few moments, and the reason a wannabe Messiah had the same logo, the same brand, it's not about the goddess Nike. It's actually about what palm trees mean in the Old Testament, which is the Bible of Jesus. So here's a quick, quick crash course on palm trees in the Bible. We've actually got to understand this if we're going to understand what Palm Sunday is all about. And it's, it's kind of challenge for our life, which is unorthodox. We'll see that. So first then in the book of Exodus, the second book of the Bible, God tells Moses, hey, I'm going to take the people of Israel to a land flowing with milk and honey. You ever heard that phrase? Flowing with milk and honey. What you may not know is that the honey in question is not the honey of bees. It's the honey of palm trees, of date palms that produce a very sweet type of honey. The promised land is a place with a lot of palm trees. Hmm. Secondly, to commemorate their time wandering from Egypt to the Promised Land, every year the Israelites threw a week-long party called the Festival of Booths. In Leviticus 23, we learn uh, that at this festival, palm branches were used, along with branches from three other types of trees, to celebrate God's faithfulness in the wilderness. And Jews still do this today, every year. Uh, it's a major holiday. And for Christians, this is of key connection. We've got to try to see this. The Festival of Booths is located within the memory of the larger story of the Exodus, when God delivered Israel from slavery in Egypt. Well, Jesus chose to die at Passover, the holiday remembering the climax of the Exodus story. Why did he do that? Because Jesus was achieving for all of us a jailbreak from the greater slavery of sin, death, and hell. Does that make sense? To see the connection between what Jesus is doing and the template, the story of the Exodus is key. Third, third, we learn in the Old Testament in Deuteronomy 34 and other places that the city of Jericho is known as the city of palms. Why? Well, because there's a, a, a major oasis there in Jericho and the palm trees love it. Palm trees have really deep roots. That's why they can thrive in a desert, but like all plants, they love regular water. And so Jericho was a place that had a lot of palms. But now wait a minute. If you know the story of Jesus, where was he right before Palm Sunday? Where did he just come from? Right over the hill. From Jericho. Maybe that's the reason everybody had palm branches. I don't know. Uh, fourth, and we'll move a bit quicker, in the book of Judges, chapter 4, we meet an amazing leader. Her name's Deborah, who held court under a palm tree. It's a symbol of leadership. In uh, 1 Kings Solomon decks out the new temple with engravings of palm trees. He's making it look like a new garden of Eden where God and humans dwell together. In Psalm 92 then, righteous people are described as palm trees who are planted right in the temple. They're like trees in Eden. 
And then in Song of Songs, a beautiful woman is described this way, and I'll just read it to you. Uh, It says this. Your stature is like a palm tree, and your breasts are like its clusters. I say, I will climb the palm tree and lay hold of its fruit. And I'll let you figure out what that means yourself. You use your imagination, okay? Um, By the way, the word in Hebrew for palm is tamar. It's where we get the name Tamra. And there's a lot of women named Tamar in the Bible. Uh, Judah's daughter-in-law, David's daughter, Absalom's daughter, it's a common name. So let's sum up. For a Jew in Jesus' day, what did a palm tree mean? Well, it means the sort of things that we've mentioned, the promised land and the temple, the Exodus story, the victory at Jericho. It was a symbol of beauty and leadership, and yes, as in the wider pagan world, of victory. But here's the twist, guys. This is so key that we see this today. The puzzling part about Palm Sunday is that Jesus didn't ask for the palms at all. They weren't in his script. Rather, he had a different script in mind with a different prop. Something that was very important to him, which in his mind signaled what this day is really all about. So let's find out together what that is. Uh, If you're able, will you stand with me for the reading of Scripture? We'll be in Mark chapter 11. And Jesus, in chapter 10, has just left Jericho. He's trekked up the steep, winding road to the capital. He's approaching over the top of the Mount of Olives. And this is where we read this, the word of the Lord. Now, when they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives... Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, Hey, go into the village in front of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it. And if anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Like, you're stealing our colt. You're jacking our car. Why are you doing this? Um, Say, The Lord has need of it, and it will send it back here immediately. We'll give it right back. And they went away and found a colt tied at the door outside in the street. And they untied it. And some of those standing there said to them, What are you doing, untying the colt? And they told them what Jesus had said, and they let them go. And they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. And many spread their cloaks on the road. And others spread leafy branches that they had cut from the field. Where does it? It doesn't even mention palms, just leafy branches. It's actually in the Gospel of John, chapter 12, verse 13, that we get the detail about palm branches, but it doesn't even make it into in here or into uh, Matthew or Luke. And those who went before and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. Now, Hosanna is a smush of two Hebrew words. Hosha which is a command. It means save. And then na at the end. That's a polite particle in Hebrew that's like saying please. So hoshana, hosanna is a forceful word. That means save us, please. It's not a phrase said by people who are celebrating. Yay. It's a phrase said by people who are desperate, who have problems far bigger than they can handle on their own. Does anybody feel that way sometimes? Hosanna is the phrase of a people on the edge. And he entered Jerusalem, and he went into the temple. And when he looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany, the house of the poor, with the twelve. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Go ahead and have a seat, if you would. So, Jesus' script for Palm Sunday doesn't even have palms in it. What it had was a colt, a little horse, or a donkey, a mule. This was important to him. Why? Because of what it wasn't. What a little colt or donkey wasn't is precisely what everybody was wanting from a Messiah. A war horse, you know, a big burly steed streaked in the blood of victory like Julius Caesar. That would be the natural accompaniment to palm branches. That would say, booyah, the big dog is here who crushes everybody. But Jesus chose a shockingly modest ride. It'd be like waiting for a head of state to appear in a motorcade of black Suburbans, and then the guy shows up driving his own 95 Nissan, and you're just like, what? I was in Jerusalem in 2013 when Obama made a state visit, and it was a huge motorcade, shut down the whole city. That 
just wasn't Jesus' style, apparently. So, okay, what was his style? He gets a little pony. What, what's he doing? Well, his style was subtle. Because Jesus knew his Bible backwards and forwards, and so did his contemporaries, he could draw deeply from this shared knowledge bank to make his actions speak louder than his words. In choosing to enter on this humble animal rather than on a war horse, Jesus is deliberately acting like several key figures in the Old Testament. First of all, he's taking his script from the prophet Zechariah, who hundreds of years before Jesus wrote of a humble king coming to Jerusalem on a colt which is contrasted with a war horse. I'll read it to you. This is Zechariah 9, 9 through 10. It says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He's righteous. He's having salvation, and he's humble. He's mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal, the baby of a donkey. Then the next verse is key. God says, I will cut off the chariot war implement from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem. The battle bow shall be cut off, and I shall speak peace to the nations. His rule shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. Jesus came to do battle all right, but to do battle against battle itself, speaking a word of shalom where there was war, and the non-threatening donkey he's riding is the way he signals this. But that's only the beginning of what Jesus is signaling. Can you think of any other important figure in the Old Testament who rides into the epic showdown on a donkey? This is Moses in Exodus chapter 4, coming to save Israel. After his years alone in Midian, when Moses is sent by God to go rescue the slaves, what's his mode of transportation back to Egypt? He comes on a donkey. This is how the Savior comes, the great Moses. Just so. This is how the ultimate Savior comes, the one greater than Moses. These parallels are not accidental. The ancients picked up on subtexts like this a lot. And by the way, we've saved the best for last because Jesus is very often called the son of David in the Bible. He was like genetically descended from David. But think about David's literal son, the guy who reigned after him. What was his name? Solomon. Do you remember how Solomon was anointed king in the Kidron Valley? This is found in 1 Kings chapter 1. It's an amazing story. It's like a court intrigue. David's lying on his deathbed And Solomon's older brother, Adonijah, has decided he's going to be king next. So he throws a big party for himself. He invites all the who's who of Jerusalem except Solomon. Well, at this point, Solomon's mother, Bathsheba, remember her? She rushes into the dying David and says to him, hey, wait, didn't you say Solomon was going to reign after you? Well, do you know that Adonijah's putting the crown on his own head right now? Were you aware of that? David, you got to do something. So the elderly king rouses himself for one last royal act. He calls his loyal corps together, which includes Nathan the prophet, and he says, this is what I want you to do. Go get my mule, sit Solomon on it, and take him down to the Kidron Valley, and there anoint him as king. And that's what they do. Solomon's anointed king in the Kidron Valley, right beneath the Mount of Olives. Now, can you think of another son of David who rode a humble beast of burden down into the Kidron Valley? as a symbolic way of receiving David's throne. Yeah, this is what Jesus is doing on Palm Sunday. Right in that valley as the crowds are saying, Hosanna to the son of David, the kingdom of David. They're thinking of the literal son of David. Like a thousand years earlier, they're thinking of this story about Solomon. And lately as a church, we've been studying a book attributed to Solomon, the book of Proverbs. And one theme that surfaces again and again in Proverbs is actually the principle beneath Jesus' whole approach to Palm Sunday. That principle is this. Humility comes before honor. Humility comes first, then honor. Proverbs 15.33 uh, 15, says this. The fear of the Lord is instruction in wisdom, and humility comes before honor. Proverbs 18.12 says this. Before destruction, before your life shatters, What were you doing just prior? Well, your heart was haughty. But humility comes before honor. Proverbs 22, 4. The reward for humility and fear of the Lord is riches and honor 
and life. Now, the word here for humility is sharp. It's not just minding your manners and not being braggy. Actually, the root has more of the flavor of suffering. It can mean like to be emaciated, hunched up, bent over, weak, you're submitted. Humility is about making yourself small and vulnerable, not in charge. Yet paradoxically, what this attitude leads to, the Bible says, is honor, which very much has to do with being in charge. In Hebrew, and by the way, sorry for all the Hebrew this morning, sometimes you just need it to get a little traction on things. The Hebrew word for honor is kavod, and it literally means weight or heaviness. Like if you rolled a bowling ball onto a trampoline, and all of a sudden there's like a bulge in it, that's kavod. Now everything just slides that way towards the center of gravity. A person with kavod, with honor, has gravitas. They're the weighty thing in the room. They don't have to throw their weight around. Stuff just happens because they're there. They have the X factor that makes them different. On Palm Sunday, Jesus knew that the way God has structured the world is that the royal road to kavod, to weighty honor, is in fact the path of humility. He knew full well the kingdom of David was his. He knew full well great kavod was in store for him, but he was under no illusions about the hellacious path that would get him there. So as others were shimmying up palm trees to lop off some fronds, implicitly demanding that Jesus follow their script for what victory looks like, Jesus was at the same time quietly directing his disciples to go borrow a humble animal that would shift the whole atmosphere. See, Jesus knew, and he'd tried to explain this many times to his disciples. They struggled to pick it up because it's a complex idea. But Jesus knew that the only way between Palm Sunday and Easter Sunday is the suffering of Good Friday. He knew that he has to accept and not flinch before the stern no of the cross in order to experience the yes of resurrection morning. As Paul writes in Philippians chapter 2, Jesus showed us what it means to be God, what it really means to love, what it really means to win. And it means to lay down your life as a servant all the way to death. Why? Because that is the only kind of maturity that God raises up to lasting honor. I mean, Caesar's empire is gone, by the way. Has anybody seen the Roman Empire lately? I haven't, I haven't seen it lately. In fact, I've been to the place in the Roman Forum where they cremated his body after he was assassinated, struggling under the knives of the friends who turned on him. It's a little shack. It's pathetic. There burned Caesar. I've also been to the place in Jerusalem where Jesus' tomb was. Not is, was. His friends turned on him too, but Jesus didn't struggle back. He let them do their worst. And today, there's a huge church built over it. The Roman Empire's gone. The church of Jesus Christ is here and still growing. The man on the donkey defeated the man on the war horse. Why? Because he knew that humility comes before honor. And Jesus doesn't have just some honor, some kavod. He has it all. He's the bowling ball in the center of the universe. Before him, every knee shall bow. Every tongue confess that he is superior, that he is wiser, that he is braver, that he is truer and purer. But his path to that glory was a universe-cracking humility, the rugged road of the cross. That was the way. And friends, that's a deep truth for us if we're followers of Jesus that has application in our lives every single day. What does it look like for us to be humble people on the road to kavod that God has for each of us, ruling as kings and queens alongside Jesus in the new heavens and the new earth? What does that look like? Well, several things. First, it means listening more than speaking. You know, the whole two ears, one mouth thing. It means being okay with the fact that sometimes we will suffer. It's just going to happen. It means being open to correction, not bridling at it. It means choosing humility before life forces humiliation on us. Because if we won't lower ourselves, life is happy to give us a good old smackdown, hard. We choose humility or it's humiliation. 
choice is ours. But by the way, humility doesn't mean thinking less of yourself. Oh, poor little me, I'm just nothing, I'm just no, no, no. No, it just means thinking about yourself less. Me becomes a boring topic all of a sudden. Like I just got other things on my mind than me. Most of all, humility means, and Proverbs makes this connection for us multiple times, it means living every day, all day, in the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord, it's not about anxiety or terror. It's not fear in that sense. It's about a deep reverence and awe before God, acknowledging the enormous chasm that exists between us and him. I like the way the Bible scholar Richard Clifford puts this. He says this, to revere Yahweh, to fear the Lord, is an act of radical humility. How so? How do those things connect? Well, because for it implies that one embraces one's true place in the world as a creature. At the end of the day, humility just means being honest about ourselves, that we're not the creator, we're the created. We're downstream, we're the creature, yet we're creatures infinitely loved by God, creatures who, if only we'll humble ourselves, God rejoices in raising up. I've actually, I've had some experience of this dynamic in my own life. Many years ago, I had a couple choices in front of me that were excruciatingly hard. And the choice was simple for me at bottom. It was, do I insist on going up or am I okay with going down? That was the choice. And with God's help and a good bit of whining and fear on my part, I chose the downward path. And had I not done that, there is zero chance I would be here today. Like, seriously. So I'll tell you about it. In my early 20s, after finishing college, I started a master's program at a seminary about an hour north of Boston. It's called Gordon-Conwell. And I chose this school for two reasons. First of all, it would allow me to do a semester abroad in Israel, which I wanted to do. And second, it was part of a group of schools at which I could cross-enroll. So my first semester, I took a couple classes at Gordon-Conwell, the seminary, and also cross-enrolled for courses at Boston College and at Harvard. And here's what I found. I hated the seminary, and I loved Harvard, and I wanted to transfer, and a couple professors there encouraged me to. They said, green light your application. Well, when I finally got around to asking God what he thought about this, I didn't like the answer at all. Only two times in my life has God spoken almost audibly, and he's not one with many words. He just said the same thing to me twice in different circumstances. No. So, being spiritually mature, I went on a long walk in the woods and threw a major prayer tantrum. Have you ever done that? I mean, I was hurling rocks and sticks and screaming at heaven and really dignified. And um, no, what was really happening is that God was exposing me to my own ego. In that restless season, I had, I had so many insecurities. I wanted to be respected. I was seeking validation, and Harvard was my ticket to all of that. Harvard would say to all the world, I'm a winner. I'm a big deal. And God nixed that idea, and that ticked me off. And also in the mix at this time was the Israel piece. Uh, I was slated to study abroad there at a small Christian school, but I didn't want small Christian school. I wanted to go to the Hebrew University, Israel's premier uh, institution. So I applied there as well. I got in. I arranged everything with the registrar. And then God gave the thumbs down to that idea, too. And after a ton of tortured prayer, in a very unhappy state, uh, I decided, fine, I'll do what God's asking me to do. I didn't apply to transfer to Harvard, and I also went to a small Christian school in Israel. And I thought I'd kissed off my chance for significance forever. I'm done. And then to compound all that insignificance, I just dropped out of grad school altogether. My life was just a mess. I had no idea where I was going. I had no idea what I believed about anything. But I remember around that time in my wallet, I carried around a little library card that I got at Harvard so I could check out books as a guest student. And man, I cherished that card. It said Harvard on it. (laughs) Made me feel so special. I was somebody, you know? I mean, I went to Harvard and I can prove it. Well, after about a year in Israel, That card really started to bug me. I didn't like that I cared so much about it. It became this little idol. My identity was attached to this stupid little piece of plastic. Well, near the place where I was working, there's this big 
pit in the ground, like 75 feet deep, where a crew was putting in the foundations for a high rise. And one day I just walked to the edge of the pit, grabbed the Harvard card out of my wallet, and I just threw it out there. And as it disappeared, I just screamed, I don't need you. And I meant it. It was deeply freeing to just be like, I'm done with this thing. Like, I am not orchestrating my life based on this brand. But let me tell you how this story ends. Because first of all, after declining to do one semester at the Hebrew University, I applied again. And during my three years in Harvard, or three years in Israel, excuse me, I did, I did five semesters at the Hebrew University. And when I eventually got back to the United States, I felt a green light in my heart from God, not to transfer to Harvard, but to apply from scratch. I did, and I got in to a master's program. Then two years later, I applied again, and I got into the PhD program. I finished that in 2021. Here's why I'm telling you this, and I feel frankly that I'm on thin ice here because it's vulnerable not only to share your screw-ups, of which I have many, but also your triumphs. I'm telling you this because I want to bear witness to the ways of God. God opposes the proud, and he gives grace to the humble. He told me no, in no uncertain terms, when I asked to transfer to Harvard, and no when I asked for one term at the Hebrew University. And do you know why? In retrospect, I believe it's because he said, Ryan, my son, your ego is way too big, and your thinking is way too small. I don't want you to do just one semester at the Hebrew University. I want you to do three years. I don't want you to do just one year as a transfer student at Harvard. I want you to do seven years. But had I bucked God when I didn't know any of that yet and said, well, sorry, God, I'm going to do things my way on my timeline, my life would look radically different today. Honestly, I'm not even sure that I would be a Christian. Harvard would have destroyed me uh, at that age. I just wasn't ready for it. And the years in Jerusalem, which changed me forever, that never would have happened. I am so glad God gave me a smackdown and endured my tantrums because it was for my own good. He forced some humility on me the hard way, but it was the path to honor. And candidly about all these nerdy honors, the Apostle Paul was totally right. None of it really matters. It's all junk compared to knowing Jesus and being known by him, loved by him. So, my friends, if you have a choice in your life between the path up and the path down, don't assume that the path up is always the right choice. If the still, small voice of God is urging the downward path for you, it may be because he has something in store for you much bigger than you're currently contemplating. It may also be because he needs to purify a few things inside you first before you're ready for those bigger things. Throw your Harvard card, whatever little idol your soul is attached to, throw it in the ditch, man. You don't need it. It's not what makes you, you. What makes you, you, paradoxically, is letting go of your favorite airbrushed version of you. And in humility, following Jesus down the Mount of Olives on a donkey. That is the royal road to honor. That is the way of the true son of David, the son of God. And you know, since we began with the crest of USC and its palm trees, maybe we can end here with the lesson about humility from Harvard's crest. Um, Here's what the current crest looks like. There's three books. They're all open and the word veritas is in them. It's Latin for truth. But Harvard's crest didn't always look this way. The original crest from the 1600s had a brilliant and humble twist. Have a look. This is what it used to look like. Do you see the third book on the bottom? It's flipped over. It's not open. It's closed. Why? It's symbolizing the reality, the truth, that there are things we humans just can't know yet. There are mysteries known only to God, and confessing these limitations as human creatures in the humble fear of the Lord is the way to veritas, the way to truth. By the way, today you only see this third downturn book at a very few old places around campus. Alas, my dear alma mater has scrubbed this humility right out of the brand. But let's assume for a moment that that third downward-facing book 
assume it's the word of God, the great mysteries of scripture that God has given us to ponder and pray through. Well, do you know one of the things that's found at the end of this book? Let me read to you from the book of Revelation. We'll close here, and my friends, I want you to listen deeply. I want you to see where the biblical story ends, where a script that is not seeking palm branches of victory. Let's see where it really ends. This is Revelation chapter 7. It says, After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They're clothed in white. And what? They have palm branches in their hands. Crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God. We cried, Hoshana, save us. And he heard us. Salvation belongs to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and kavod and power and might and all this stuff belongs to our God forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. You're very surprising, God. Because when we humans think we're a big deal, we want everybody to know it. But you're the God of the universe. And you came incognito. You entered the great city with humility. Lord, would that spirit, that surprising royal path, find its place in each of our hearts? each of our minds. Lord, whether we've been a Christian for a super long time or we're super new or we're just here because somebody made us come, I pray that at Easter time this year, you would sensitize us to the truth that humility precedes honor. Would you give us wisdom how to apply that in our life? Instead of flexing like you, Jesus, we can actually get down on our knees, pick up a towel, and wash the dirty feet of the very people going to betray us. Help us to do that, O Spirit. As we move through this week, I pray you'd heighten our awareness of the presence of God. May we not run away from what the cross means. May we square up to it and think and pray about it, knowing full well that on the far side of that, far side of the gift of God that saves us, that steps in the way of wrath on our behalf, on the far side of that, is new life, is new creation, is new victory forevermore. We love you. We trust you. And Lord, we fear you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you, friends. It's great to study the scriptures together. Hey, uh, before we bounce, just one quick announcement for you. Um, so the Deeper Bible podcast, which I host, is looking for someone with some experience in the social media world who can help us to reach some more people. Uh, we've actually just turned a junky storage closet downstairs into this new recording studio. And we're looking for a teammate who can create some socials content across platforms that's true to the heart of this ministry. Um, a little know-how and graphic design would also be helpful. Uh, and there may also be a stipend involved. So um, anyways, if that's of interest, you can get in touch with Deeper's director. Her name's Destiny Kennedy, and um, she's actually sitting right over here. So after service, you can either just go chat with her. She's going to hang out, or you can email her. Her email is destiny at the bay dot church, and it's in our app notes today. If you, if you follow the sermon on the app, her email's in there too. So uh, with that, would you stand? I'd love to leave you with a blessing before we part. My friends, may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his face upon you. And in the name of Jesus, the name of the King of Kings, give you shalom, give you peace. Amen. Amen. Have a great week, everybody. God bless you.